Hey guys, we're back with another episode of You Ask Me Stuff and I Try to Answer. By the way, how do you like the new hat? I posted this on the Instagram and the Facebook group, but I am digging it. I really like it a lot. So I think I'm gonna need to get a few more of these. All right, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, first question, should you lower prices for a pop-up or craft show uh, or keep them the same as you would normally sell like on your website? Well, uh, that's a really good question. And I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer, but I'll tell you what I do and it seems to work pretty well. In fact, I have here on the channel a couple of videos talking about how my craft shows go. Uh, the last one I did was uh, right before Christmas, so uh, late November, and uh, yeah, two days, did around 5,000, something like that. I can't remember exactly what, what it was. It was a good amount though for like eight hours of work. So anyways, check that out if you want more information on how I kind of run those craft shows. But specifically answering this question about what you do about your prices, well, let's let's think of it this way. There are advantages and disadvantages when it comes to selling products at a craft show. Let's start with the advantages. First of all, and probably the biggest, is that your customers are there physically for the purpose of buying products. That's why they're at a craft show or a holiday boutique or whatever you want to call it. And the purpose that for them being there is to purchase products. And so that is obviously some leverage for you. They don't have to deal with shipping. They don't have to deal with the website. They get to purchase the stuff and take it home. Another advantage is that customers can actually see urgency among the products. If they see products that are going quickly or low in stock, they might think that you don't get another chance. So that's another feather in the cap for you. Now, some disadvantages would be that there are costs to these craft shows. Uh, there's likely a cost to run a booth, and there's often some type of commission or sales commissions that you have to give back to whoever's hosting the event. So there is some expense to selling your products, and it's usually higher than what it be, would be at selling like on your website. So that would be the biggest probably disadvantage. And of course, taking a lot of product home that didn't sell. That's That'd be a bummer. So my advice would be focus on the advantages and how can you capitalize on that. Customers are there to buy and they don't have to deal with shipping. So the short answer is, is I don't know that you have to change your prices to compete with what's on the website because there's already an inherent advantage for them to purchase from you at the show. One, they get to take it home. Two, they don't have to deal with shipping. So it's usually cheaper for them anyways, even if the product cost is the same. Now, if you're someone that works all of your shipping cost into your product cost, then yeah, you could probably lower your product cost a little bit for a show, but kind of setting that aside, what I would do, however, is have some type of show sale or show promotion. So a reason for them to buy now, outside of the other reasons we already talked about, something to encourage them not to wait. They're not gonna be able to get the same deal on the website. They might not get this next year. What can you do to encourage customers to buy from you that day? So some kind of special like a buy three and get one free. Buy one, get one half off. Or buy this and you get a free whatever. You know, anything like that is what I would encourage. So. Pricing? Nah, you don't really need to change it, but throw in a show special. All right, next up, by the way, these questions are all coming from you. So uh, comments on previous YouTube videos, questions in the Facebook group, questions on Instagram, really wherever you guys want to submit questions, go for it and uh, I will just keep adding them to a list. Then I'm gonna try to get to these questions periodically, hopefully like weekly uh, and do these type of videos. So if you have any questions, like things we don't talk about today, anything that you are curious about when it comes to candle making and running a candle business, small business, uh, put it in the comment section below and I'll just continue to add those to the list for the next video. Okay, best place to make a logo. All right, so this is for those looking to start a brand or start a business, right? Uh, there again, isn't really a best answer, but I can tell you some experiences. First of all, you can try to do it yourself through logo generation programs. And there are software, there's software you can buy, there's websites that allow you to do uh, logo generation. The problem with these is they're usually not very unique and they're mostly cookie cutter. So you're gonna find a lot of logos that are just like them or people kind of reusing the same thing. Uh, so my advice would be, if you have any graphic design experience and what you wanna go about it yourself, use a program like Photoshop or Canva and try to come up with something that's unique specifically to you and your brand, or this is something that's probably worth outsourcing. And there's a couple reasons for that. First, let me tell you where you can do it. And that would be like Upwork.com or Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R. -E or you can hire any graphic designer to do that as well. Here is the major benefit. First of all, it's not that expensive. It's a one-time cost and then you own that. You own that logo file and no one else can use it. They're not supposed to anyways. And then uh, number two, the biggest advantage is a graphic designer or someone that you hire on Fiverr or freelancer is going to design this in a format that is meant to be used as a logo. So it'll work on shirts and signage. It'll work on brochures. It'll work on, you'll get a PNG, a JPEG, all these different formats, vector files so that you can resize and use this logo however you want. 
If you don't know how to do that as a designer yourself, you're going to run into a problem at some point without the right file format. So that would be my advice. I would hire that one out. Um, what I did for my logo, Black Tie Barn, is it's very simple, right? It's, it's, uh, the lettering is kind of, well, it's kind of hard to see on the hat, but it is a little bit wider. It shrinks in, shrinks in and, well, I don't know how to describe it. Look on my website, you'll see it. And then the bow tie. It has morphed and changed a little bit over the years. It's actually gotten more simple, a little bit more modern. I like to kind of keep it nice and clean, a little more sophisticated, I guess. And so I took files that I had previously done in the past, and then I, and I, and I have some experience with graphic designs, enough to be dangerous, I guess. I eventually, most recently, had I just reached out to someone and asked them to take my current concept and just clean it up a little bit, make it, you know, give me a little variation, maybe simplify it, give me all the formats I need, and that's what I did. So I gave, I designed the concept and let them kind of do the magic to give the final touches. All right, what do I do with my test candles and jars? Yeah, that's another question that uh, is good, and I don't know that I'm the best person to give the answer on. I can tell you what I should be doing, and then I'll tell you what I actually do. What I should be doing is uh, cleaning those jars out routinely, like when I'm done with them, and then uh, reusing those jars. And the way you can do that is just uh, boil some water in a pot. You can take uh, uh, your jars and, and put them like a double boiler and, and re-melt the wax and then get the wax out. Um, if it's really low, just a little bit of wax left, you can just uh, pour boiling water into it, and that'll cause the wax to kind of break up right at the top. You can take the wax out and reuse the jars for testing. And so long story short, what you could do is just simply clean out the jars and reuse the wax for testing if you want, like if it's mostly usable wax still that you can retest with it like a new wick, or you can make fire starters out of it. There's, there's, do whatever you want with the wax. Long story short, the jars then you could reuse. I would really only reuse them for testing probably. Uh, and there's, there's various reasons for that, but I would reuse these jars for testing. What I actually do in real life is create a giant stockpile of them. Uh, I've got thousands of them that eventually I'll go through. Or at least I keep telling myself that. But for now, they just continue to take up space and sit there. That's what happens when you just don't have time. How would I go about selling wholesale? I guess it kind of depends on where you are in your career. If you already have established business, you know, if you've got a website, you got a storefront, all these things are gonna determine the best way to approach this. You could send someone to your website or have them come by your store and check out what you have. You know, there's there's various ways to do that. If you're a new business and you don't really have a, you don't have a storefront, and maybe your website is mo mostly focused on retail, but I would still mention that to them so they could see the options you offer. But what you should really do, for lack of better words, is create a wholesale kit. And this is a sample pack of a few of your, maybe your best sellers or a few options that you want to push for wholesale. I would actually create like a full size or two candle to give them and then maybe smaller ones as samples of different fragrances, whatever that you want to sell to them. Uh, create a line sheet or a rate sheet, which is basically a list of what you would sell wholesale. Uh, what the item is, maybe a photo of each one, and then the price that you would sell at wholesale. And then the best approach is really just to go to these stores physically and uh, drop off this kit. So the sample, the information, uh, if the manager's there or the owner's there, ask to talk with them and just say, hey, I'm, I'm a so-and-so, I, I run so-and-so shop here in so-and-so city, and uh, I was looking to maybe work with you. And uh, here are my products, here's some samples, here's a rate sheet, and I'd love to hear from you. Give them some time. Uh, a lot of times it takes weeks, months for them to get back to you. They're business owners like you. They're very, very busy. Uh, there's been times where I've heard back months and months later. So uh, that is one option. Uh, a lot of times the owner won't be there. So feel free to still leave your products and your kit if you would like to with a uh, some kind of note. Have that note ready in case there is not an owner there that to speak with. And it just says your name and a little letter basically of, of who you are, why you stopped by. The same thing you would have started with if, if you could talk to them face to face. Uh, another thing you can do is also start off with email or phone call and uh, initiate the initial point of contact that way. I would especially do that if they're not local and you're gonna have to drive a distance first because uh, you might wanna save yourself a trip. And you could also reach out to potential retail accounts that are not local. They could be further, you know, remote accounts. And then, of course, there's shipping to deal with and all of that. But it's the same process, essentially. Reach out, ask if they're interested, provide as much information as you can, ask them if they're interested in samples, and then be willing to send a small sample set. Now, you know, be reasonable. Make sure you're only sending something you can afford and do. But it does take some money to make some money. And if you're going to do some wholesale accounts, you got to be willing to give away some samples and some products and some information about your products and your business. So that's what I would do. That's that's how I tackle wholesale. Okay, I would love if you could go over the best waxes to use for wax tarts or wax melts in snap bars. Again, I don't know if there's a best one to use. Um, in fact, I know there's not a best one, uh, but there is certainly better choices uh, compared to others. For example, there are certain waxes that you can use for both container candles and uh, wax melts. Uh, not 
many because most container waxes are a little too soft. Uh, they're meant to be in a container. There is a difference and wax melts or snap bars uh, tend to be a little bit firmer, harder. Uh, they're meant to snap, be put in a, in a melter. Um, and so, and you don't have to worry about wicking on those at all. So they are usually a different wax. Again, usually there are people that use the same wax for both. I, in my experience, it's usually not been the best choice. But again, that depends on what wax you're using for both, right? Some good choices, if you're looking specifically for a wax melt blend that's already created for the purpose of being used for melts, uh, I would look at ProBlend 650. I would look at Pillar of Bliss. I would look at uh, TW30, um, C55. There are other ways to wax melt blends though. You could do it yourself. So another popular one, is to take IGI 6006, which is a container wax, and mix it with like 5050 IGI 4625, which is a hard wax melt wax. You can mix the two together. It also makes a great combination. How do you know for sure how many of each fragrance candle to bring to a spring market? They said specifically spring market. Um, I don't know that it differs between that or holiday, although holiday shows are usually bigger. I usually have a lot more options, so. But in general, how many to bring to a market or craft show? There's no specific answer to that either. Uh, if you don't have a lot of options, then you're not going to bring too many. If you have way too many options like I do, then you've got to make some choices. And I'm not the best at doing that sometimes. In fact, I tend to always bring too much of some stuff and not enough of others. And then I end up bringing more the next day, which is fine, which is totally fine. You, you live and you learn. Every show is different. Um, but you will start to learn what products do better for you year after year, and which type of products do better for you in general. And so I would always bring the most of your best sellers. Focus on your best sellers, funnel people to your best sellers. When you get uh, at a show and you're setting up, put your best sellers front and center. Draw people in, that is what's gonna sell the most, it's gonna have the highest conversion, right? So you might have all these great options in the background, but if the product that has the highest conversion, meaning people see it, they buy it, you want those products front and center first. Draw them in, convert some sales. Now, having other choices and options is a great idea, but be careful. The more you bring, the less depth or quantity you'll have of each one, and that can leave you thin on some. Determine what you think is going to be the best based off of what you've sold and done in the past. Bring most of that. Bring plenty of those, and then bring, you know, um, half a dozen or a dozen of some of these other ones that you want to try out. And that's what I use craft shows for as well. Not just to sell, but also to try out new products. So make sure you highlight some of your new products as well and then bring enough. Well, <laughs> the question is what's enough? So that, that doesn't really help you, but uh, bring some and, uh, and, and see how it goes and then learn from that. And next time you know how to bring more. There's, there, this is a learning process. It always will be. You're always going to learn and adapt. There's no just magical answer of bring 10 cents and a dozen of each one. They're just uh, oftentimes less is more, but uh, make sure you have some variety because you want to be able to appeal to different kind of tastes. So I know that's not the greatest answer, but check out my craft show videos. They go into a lot more detail. Difference between a LLC and a DBA and so on. All right, I've got several videos on this topic as well, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but in short, if you are a sole proprietor, meaning an individual running a business, you would uh, choose a business name. So this is not an LLC. This is if I was starting a new business as a person, I would go to my secretary of state and register for a DBA, which is a doing business as name. So mine could be Wade Thomas doing business as Black Tie Barn. So my business name effectively becomes Black Tie Barn, but I'm still an individual just running, selling products under a different name, running a business under a different name. That is how most people start. You are a sole proprietor is what that's called and you're using a different name. Uh, your taxes will go right through your personal tax return like normal. Uh, there's no protection of assets or liabilities here. Your business and you are essentially the same thing. But it is how most people start and it's obviously the cheapest because there's really no cost to it other than registering your fictitious name, which is like seven bucks in most places. Uh, an LLC is the step up from that. And there are several levels, different arrangements of an LLC, but in short, an LLC stands for limited liability company. It's a distinction between you and your company. So there's you as an individual and your business is, is a separate entity. The benefits of an LLC are a little bit more liability protection. So it will separate and protect your assets to a degree. It's not, it's, it's sort of a gray area. There is some separation between your business and you essentially, right? And it also does add some legitimacy to your business. You have a separate business entity. Uh, Black Tie Barn LLC, for example, is my company. Now, you're gonna hear a lot of people talk about an S Corp and all these other things. That is a tax structure, not a business structure. So uh, an LLC can file taxes as an S Corp. All right, so they, it's different. And I've got a video on this. You can check it out in more detail. But um, typically as a sole proprietor or an LLC, your taxes 
fall through your business to your personal tax return and you file a Schedule C to file your taxes. But an LLC can also file taxes as a S Corp, which means the business pays its own taxes separately and the individual pays its own separately. Pros and cons to that, unless you're netting 60,000 plus a year, and there's a lot of other factors as well, then it's usually not worth talking about an S Corp until that point. A lot of pros and cons. But an LLC can also file taxes as a partnership. So you have an LLC, but your taxes are a partnership. So if you've got a partner with you, then you would likely be doing an LLC partnership. That's the two in a nutshell. I have videos that go into a lot more detail on how to set those up. I'll check them out on the channel if I remember, I'll link them. But if not, if you go to my channel on YouTube, Black Tie Barn, and then you click on the main channel and then go to videos, you can go search through them all. And there's also a playlist for business videos. Do you need UV inhibitor? So UV inhibitor is ultraviolet inhibitor. And the main purpose of it is to help keep your colors richer and lasting longer if you're using dye in your candles from exposure to ultraviolet light. So like overhead retail lights, not LED, that's fine. Um, and then other forms of light are fine as well. So it's, it's your typical UV light, sunlight, for example, and certain indoor lighting. So when would you consider using UV? inhibitor. One, are you coloring your candles? If not, there's no really a reason to do it other than maybe just consistency. Like you put it in all your products, that's fine, but there's no real reason to use it if you're not using color. Two, if your candles are moving very, very quickly and they're, you, you make them, they stay in dark places and then you ship and sell them. A lot of people don't use it for that reason. There's just not enough exposure and the candles are moving so quickly that the colors never really have time to fade. Uh, so if you have that, situation, that's great for you. Then that means you're turning over your inventory very quickly. Your candles are being used by consumers very quickly and you're always making more and selling more. Probably not too much of a reason to do it. But those would be the two, those would be the two factors that determine whether you should consider it. Uh, now, do you need to? Is it ever required? No, it's an optional product. If you don't use it over time, your candles as they sit in UV light and getting exposed to it can start to discolor. Certain colors are worse about it than others. It just depends. It also depends on how your fragrance oil is reacting as well. Over time, it can start to fade or discolor or change colors a little bit. So if you are concerned about that or experiencing that and it's due to light exposure, the new V inhibitor could help you. How much to use? Usually around a half a teaspoon per pound. That's just a general rule of thumb. Many of you might be thinking, well, my candle is yellow all the time. I get discoloration from candles that are sitting too long, uh, even if you don't use color. Okay, so that is caused from the vanillin, usually the vanillin in certain fragrance oils. UV inhibitor will not help with that. So I get that question all the time. No, the UV inhibitor will not help with that, unfortunately. It's not gonna hurt it, but it's not gonna help. Candles made with vanillin, uh, it's just certain fragrance oils are gonna cause that to happen. So I usually stock less of those unless they're just very fast moving products. What do I use to insert and center my wicks? All right, so most of you already know, I use Norden Wicks, uh, Norden Candle Company, uh, and their wick tools and wick setters. So I use the thing that puts the, well, let me just show you. So here's an example of a nine ounce straight sided jar uh, wick setter. So you insert the wick through the bottom, hook it on the top, and then you put it over your jar and you go like that, and it inserts the wick. And then on top of the jar, you have the wick tools, sits on top and holds the wick in place. The design of these is incredible, much better than any others I've ever used. That's why I've entirely switched over to these, by the way. Uh, and they come in all sorts of different colors. In fact, they got a whole slew of new colors. I, I, I think I showed on a recent video and I'll have them linked in the description below as well. Um, they have all sorts of options. They have them for every jar. In fact, here's a double wick one, same concept, right? And they work on like, like this is for the aura jar and uh, the double wick top. Like they've got them for every, pretty much every jar, every common jar, actually non-common jars as well. You go to the website, you click on the supplier that you use or the jar you use, and it will help you determine which ones you need. Again, all sorts of colors. You can custom brand the outside. If they don't have what you want or need, you message them, you let them know, and they'll make it. They do this all in-house. If you have any more questions about that though, check out a video. I've got a whole video talking, showing them off the products and how it works and all of that. Uh, oh, they've also made a slight improvement recently. So anyone that's used jars that were taller, then they were wide, like basically tall, skinny jars, or not even just skinny, just taller jars. Uh, as you notice, this is a long neck, right? Or a long tube. Oops, upside down. And when you would insert this in, there's a little bit of wiggle on some of them, just a little bit. And it can be enough every once in a while to make the wick just a tiny bit off center, like not really enough that's gonna impact the burn at all. But every once in a while, you might look at your jars and be like, well, that one's not quite as perfect as all the others. And that's just because if you're moving really fast, that little bit of wiggle, because this is so long can cause an issue. So they've made improvements now where this part 
actually protrudes much further down into the jar, actually like this, like this one. See how far this one goes down into the jar? So there's no wiggle on that one at all. They've started making that improvement across the board. So if you uh, reach out to them, if you've had that issue and, uh, or check out the website, you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, that answers that question. Let me put these back. What do I do to prevent cross scent in my pouring pots between batches? Okay, good question. So, so you got your pouring pots, you make a batch of candles, you make one called Macintosh apple, smells great, you pour all your candles, you go to clean this out, you think you got it all, you make your next batch of candles and you're making, I don't know, an ocean fragrance or something, and it still smells a little bit like apple. That's what this question's about. The first thing I would tell you is it's not near as big of an issue or risk that you think it would be. For starters, once you pour your candles, grab your paper towel, wipe it out thoroughly. I just wipe it out really, really good and get as clean as possible. Sometimes I'll grab another one, do it again. Uh, if you are using a wax that cools very, very quickly and it's already kind of firming up inside, grab your heat gun, heat it back up. It'll get hot enough, it'll wipe right out. Honestly, most of the time, that's gonna be plenty enough. The minuscule amount, the minuscule amount of fragrance that's still trapped or you feel like is is in on the stainless steel on the inside it, if it transfer you're never going to notice it you're just not going to notice it if you are noticing it then you're just not getting enough out after you pour now another thing that a lot of people do is they will use some uh spray alcohol rub, rubbing alcohol and it'll mist a little bit in there and wipe it out if you're going to do that please give it enough time to dry in between and make first of all make sure you get it all out with the paper towel afterwards and then let it air out it, it's, it's rubbing alcohol burns off, evaporates very, very quickly, so it doesn't take too long. But I've seen people spray it with alcohol, wipe it out real quick, and then go right to another batch. You're risking getting some rubbing alcohol into your batch of candles. That's way worse of a problem. Another thing you can do is there are products on the market that's specifically designed to help with things like this. There is a product called 7X Cleaner, and uh, it will it will just take out your, your fragrance oil to dye everything like that. Actually, that would be a good product for maybe me to start supplying you guys as well on the website. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. I, I buy it in bulk right now because uh, I use a ton of it, but uh, let me let me know if you guys would be interested in that. All right, well, interesting. Speaking of products that I sell, uh, do I sell my wicks to Germany or anywhere else overseas? So I'm based in the US. What this question's referring to, if you're not familiar, is that I now sell my Premier 700 wicks, which is the wicks that I use at 95, 98% of my candles. I will have a link to uh, to them in the description below. If you want to check them out, they work with a majority of waxes out on the market. Of course, it's not going to work with 100% of them. No wick really does. Uh, so if you're interested in trying them out, I will have that information below. I sell a sample pack too, if you have no idea where to start. It's like five of every size. So check it out if you want. But the question is, is do I sell them overseas? Currently, no. I sell them to Canada and I sell them to US because it was just the easiest one to get started. There are some other complexities when it comes to setting up for international, but I am working on it. So A, I'm making sure all the options are there for me to do it. And then B, I will work on implementing it on the site. If you haven't already, sign up for the newsletter below. Once I do start selling them international, I, make sure, I will make sure I send out a, a, a post about it. Can I talk more about beeswax? Uh, nope. Not really. I mean, I can talk about it, but uh, I'm not an expert on it. Beeswax is a harder wax, a little tougher to burn. It's a good, great wax, high quality wax. It's hard to use in container candles by itself because it's so hard uh, and, and got a very high melt point and it can be really, really tough to wick. Most jars, really anything over like two and a half inches is going to need a very, very large hot wick or two wicks. If you're using beeswax, you might want to look at a wick like a square braid wick, for example, or maybe CD. You need something that burns really hot. Um, and you're definitely gonna have to wick up if you're used to working with like a low melt point soy or paraffin. That being said, if you guys are interested in more information about using beeswax, because it also does make a great blending wax. So there's a lot of wax blends out there that have some beeswax in there. Or if you make pillar candles or all sorts of other applications, if you are interested in more information on beeswax, let me know because I've got some resources that can help out. It's not my area of expertise, but part of this channel is helping you guys by sharing information and resources, even if I don't have it directly. So let me know and I'll bring on a resource to help out. And speaking of questions, comments, and interest, if you guys have any more questions that you wanna ask me on candle making, uh, wax melts, running a candle business, running any kind of handcrafted business, let me know in the comments. I'm gonna build some more questions up and we'll do another video soon. But that wraps up today's questions. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, got some uh, decent answers and some tips along the way. Again, please feel free to share your questions in the comments below. If you like videos like this, check out this video here. If not, check out this one that YouTube's recommending that uh, you might enjoy as well. Heck, it might be the same video, I don't know. Thanks for being here. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Give this video a thumbs up and I'll see you all next time. Thanks.